understand the decision? Sealum Tower, does anyone know the translation? Small yeah, small little idea. That's how most people translate it. The tra direct translation is seal, which is small or little. Lim actually means to train. The Tao represents, if you have the Tao symbol on its own, it just represents head. But when you put it in context with the seal, Lim Tao, it represents idea. Small to train idea. Um, uh, small train. Um, it doesn't translate very well into English. The way I usually um, explain it to people is to train efficiently and economically, which is the small, within time, space, and energy. That represents the idea. Another way I heard it, I heard it explained is it's like looking at a, the tip of an iceberg. You only see the little small bit at the top, but underneath is a great big mass uh, or foundation. Okay, that's the same idea. So. Uh, a lot of what you do in Silam Tao, in, in, in performing the techniques, the right movement in the right positions of your body, getting the right energy uh, moving through your body when you're actually applying these different movements, uh, it gives you a real foundation. It gives you the, the baseline to all the movements. And a lot of the techniques and uh, concepts you look at and examine in the seal and towel really can give you the answer to a lot of the questions or um, the difficulties you can come to in your actual training. You can actually go refer back to the seal and towel and actually often find the answer in seal and towel. Okay. Now, we're going, to, we're going to devote a lot of time at the beginning to uh, looking at the techniques and understanding how we apply these movements. Okay, uh, so Some of you have done this uh, a little bit with me in uh, the Monday evening classes where you're looking at some of the direct translations of some of the movements. But we're going to, we're going to delve in a little bit more today and uh, look at some of the uh, some other, um, other techniques that we use uh, in different ways. Okay. Um, all right, so there's structure and then there's form. We, we categorize the hand, uh, the choreographed, choreographed hand routines, what we call forms. But form is like uh, your technique. Structure is like your stance and your balance. So there's a couple of translations. I might say balance and your stance, but when I speak structure, I mean both. Okay, when I talk about form, it's usually how you are maintaining your, your movements that you learn from your form, your si lim tao. Okay. Um, all right, so there's a few important things that you have to think about in, in the si lim tao form when you're, you're, you're performing it. One is, um, what are you doing? What are you doing with your eyes? What are you doing with your breathing? Um, okay, and what is the intention of your movement? When performing the form, all right, the, the, the basic neutral stance applies. So your feet are pointing forward. Um, we don't shuffle into our stance. We, we open up with the circle step. When you circle step, a lot, of, a lot of people when they do the circle step, they lift their feet quite high. We don't want to lift our feet quite high, even though you may see it in other, other lineages or other instructors doing that. I was always taught to keep the toes like you're drawing a circle on the ground, a half circle on the ground with just the tip of your toe. You don't have to touch the ground, but you want to keep it very close to the ground to be, to be close and ready to access the toes, okay? Then we don't want to stomp, come down onto the heel. We don't want to lift the feet upwards. When we've opened into the position, we're not turn the feet in, even though you see some lineages of doing this. Our feet are directly forward. The pelvis, uh, the, when, we, when we have opened into the stance, you lift the fingers. You're, you've done, all done this as beginners. You bend the knee and lock the pelvis. When you lock your pelvis, you're unifying the base with your upper body with the base of your body. So that's important that uh, a lot of systems are very loose through the hips because they pivot and move through the hips. We want to access the power because we don't generate power from twisting and using the, out, the elbow out and the hip, uh, punching from the hip and the elbow out. We want to have the elbow in. We, when we step the whole frame, we want the, the, the power from 
the, our strike to come from the leverage of our body and the movement of our body. Okay? So again, when you bend your knees, uh, again, some, some people have their feet together. When you, when you stand, if you just stand like this, your feet right together, and then stand up straight. You feel the, the tension through your thighs, inside of your thighs. It doesn't feel natural at all. So if you just open out just slightly, it relaxes that tension a little bit. Okay. Now, again, you lift the fingers, you pull back, uh, you bend your knee, you lock your pelvis, that unifies the body. Then you do your circling movement. You're doing your circling movement. And then your feet should be directly forward. Your pelvis is maintained that lock position as you're opening out. Okay. Now you're in your neutral stance. Okay. Now, you squeeze your knees together. Okay. And it's like you're pulling your feet together without pulling your feet together with your legs. And so the quadriceps should be activated. Your glutes should be activated. The two biggest muscle groups in your body. Okay. So that's essential to understand that you're working from your, your structure, your balance and your uh, stance. And th again, then your mobility, when you start to move, you should be working from these muscle groups and maintaining that, that strength there. Um, again, when you move, you don't, you're not squeezing as, as much as you would be when you're performing the form. But as you're learning the form, because it's not a natural position to stand in, and definitely not a natural position to move around in and, f and have combat or self-defense or fighting in, part of the reason you squeeze and contract those muscles while you're in that stance is to program that position into your system. It's like muscle memory, you understand? A guy does a, goes into tennis, he learns a forehand. So he programs that muscle movement over and over again. So when he's in the midst of a, you know, uh, a, a rally or a big set and lots of sets and you know, he's a professional, he's not thinking about the action of that movement anymore. He's thinking about where he's hitting the ball. He's not thinking about what he's doing here. Okay? So the same thing applies here. When you lock this and squeeze and you're performing your form, you don't relax and stand up straight. Again, you bend, you lock, your back straight state, and you circle, okay? and then you squeeze. Then when you start to make it mobile and you start to introduce footwork and you, you, you start to step, step and maybe squeeze, step, step, just program that tension. So when you really start moving around, your back is straight and your, your weight is centered. You're, when you get into that combat situation, you automatically get down into it. You're not, you're not wobbling through here and losing, losing leverage and balance. Okay. All right. Now, the first thing you do is this movement here. Oh, actually, it's this movement here, the Tai Sao. Lifting hand, lifting hand. Okay. This, um, it defines, or when you drag your hands up, it, your hands are on either side of your center line. So it's like they're on the, on the outside of the central lines. So you, you first of all, identifying two lines that travel up like this outside of the rectangle, yeah? So you lift up, you, you seize, so it's like a double grab, you reverse elbow strike. This is probably the most common movement in the whole form. You repeat it over and over and over again. Why? Why is, why is there such a significant emphasis on doing that? If you, if you consider self-defense, pure self-defense, and you get attacked, the person who attack you is a coward. So how do they generally attack you? From behind. From behind. So getting grabbed from behind, this movement, this movement, doesn't matter if it's lower uh, reverse elbow or higher reverse elbow, it's a self-defense mechanism to stop a person holding you or, you know, creating space for yourself. Okay? All right, so you've tied, then you bring your hands back, okay? You do your straight punch, okay? You do your straight punch, all right? Um, I should go back a bit because we do this crossing hands maneuver. Before we even do this, we do this, 
we pull back tie, we open up, and we, as you open, all right, so a lot of people break this into two components. What the way I teach it is you lift, you seize, reverse elbow, bend your knee, lock your pelvis, open up into the stand. But as I open up with this foot, that's when I hit down. As I open here, boom. So as you're coming down, your weight is coming down here out of your circle step, you're thrust down and up. Now, this movement, as I said at the beginning when you, you lift like this, this gives you two vertical lines here. Again, it has a self-defense application, which some of you have done before. Okay. Uh, the basic self-defense application is um, before some, someone can get their arms completely around you, you lift and hit and you can come up over the top. But you're bringing your hands up to stop them controlling the arms. All right. Thank you. Um, this gives you the outside lines of a box, a rectangle. You pull back, rah, 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 open up. Then we do the corners and now we do the sides again. This defines what we represent, the box of operation. Box of operation where pretty much everything is applied in front of us. But that box can move. Understand, when I cross like that at the wrists and draw at that space, it defines a, a few concepts. Not just identifying that box in front of me, which is where a lot of the techniques that we use uh, are um, in, because I don't need to block anything that's over there or try to meet something. If it comes inside that space, then we deal with it. Then you deal with it, be it on the center line or on the central line, because the sides of the rectangle are central. The center of the box is the center. A lot of our blocks happen on the center and central. But it means really that I can use two arms at the same time. When I'm facing here, here, but when I turn this uh, into a front stance, which is now I'm in a neutral stance facing Glenn, so here, I can then just turn my pelvis slightly and I'm still in a front stance, but now I can do the same thing right there, which still means I can use two arms at the same time. Now when you stand like that in front of someone, it just deceives people because they think this hand is much closer than this hand, back hand. If I do it front fronting here now, so my neutral stance facing you, but then I turn the mirror, there's my front stance, my guard. Okay, so they think, okay, this hand must be further away. It's not really. But any further than that, if I'm here or here, any further than that point, something happens. One starts getting shorter, you know? So I can really use two arms for almost 180 degrees as long as I move my pelvis a little bit, lock my pelvis a little bit. Okay, so I identify where I can use two arms at the same time, but where I cross my wrists is important because a lot of the two-handed blocks, the bonsal, the wing, doesn't matter if your wusao is here or here, because wusao would be probably back here if I'm dealing with a straight punch. If I deal with a straight punch, I might have the wusao back a little bit, so then I can come with the lapsao. But if you threw the round punch off the rear, then I probably want my wusao to meet at almost identical, you understand? Because the wusao, if I just do the bonsai back here, this is probably gonna ride up, yeah? So I have the wusao here, so then I can either control with the lap sao through here, or maybe I can redirect here, or with the tan sao. So, again, two-handed block, be a bonsao, or a quan sao, just a round punch here, a quan sao, or you'll grab me here, a quan sao, two-handed block, a uh, kan sao, sorry, excuse me, kan sao. If, if it's quan sao, it's the same, almost the same as a bon sao, but one is bon, one is tan. But again, you understand that there's at the wrist, at the wrist, here, here, at the wrist. So it's, it's basically saying, okay, if you're gonna use a two-handed block, do it at the wrist. I don't want to do it up here. Why not? 
happen. Yeah, they won't get, get up on your elbow and trap you. You can be trapped by big, having on top of your opponent's arm or underneath the opponent's arm. All right? So here, say, okay, if you're going to cross your arms, don't do it any deeper than your own wrists. All right? Or if you're going to cross, don't cross your arm. You can put your palm on there, but you can't put your hand across. All right, now I'll show you why. Um, it's interesting because this basically gives you an, a, a, an answer for being crossed. This movement is the answer for being crossed. That's right at the end of the form. But we'll look at this in a second. Okay. If Daryl puts his hand here with his musa here, he traps himself here. All right. He, you know, he can, he can, there's lots of ways you can defend being crossed. But for a moment, he leaves himself uh, vulnerable to being crossed. We just change side. So if you put the wusa deep, you have an opening to be crossed. Or if he takes and blocks, he gives the opportunity to be crossed underneath. See, that time I crossed him, I took this arm underneath to cross underneath. Just change this side. You cross underneath. Then I can cross back on top. You understand? So it's saying, okay, be careful putting your hands across your arm. All right? Okay. So, it uh, d defines the center and the central lines. It tells you where you should block if you're going to use two arms at the same time, close to your wrists. Okay? And these really identify the, the blocks we were looking at a moment ago, the Khan Sao, the Quan Sao, anything, your Bon Sao, anything you're using two hands with. Okay. The straight punch. Now, this is the first Point, the first point in the form where you drive your elbow in. You bring your left hand into the center. You're not aiming it up under your chin. A lot of, you see a lot of guys like, like this and then they punch forward like this or they, they go like this and then they punch forward like this. I was taught to drive your elbow forward and aim the forearm at, at what you're going to punch. Now, you don't turn your hand up like that or on an angle. I was taught to do it with a vertical fist while your other hand, other hand is pulled back up away from the body. So whenever we're doing isolating one arm with a technique, the other arm is not going to sleep. You don't put it down here or rest it down here like this. Some systems, they, they move around with it on their hips. We don't. The hand should the free the hand that is not activated or not actually applying the technique. I shouldn't say activated because it's, the energy should be still on there. It should be up. Now the forearm should be parallel to the floor. So you shouldn't be like that or like that. It should be parallel to the floor. The wrist, the fist should be uh, there. Should be space between your your body. A little bit of space between your body and and the arm. So you shouldn't be resting at all, okay? The fist should be in line with your forearm. Like if you rested it on something or you rest it, there should be a straight line from your forearm to the top of your knuckles. It shouldn't be, a, it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be like that. You know, you see people, they can tort their arms. They can tort their arms. Try to keep it level. All right. So, and pull back up away from the body. So, you know, Lift your shoulder, it shouldn't be, a, you know, you're doing something, you're up like this or something stupid. It, you, you want to maintain good st um, structure and form through your, your body, yeah, the positions of your body. Okay, so it's up, it's on. People go, oh, my arm's getting sore. Good, it should be sore, it should be uncomfortable so you know it's there. Because when you're doing something and this, doesn't, this just goes to sleep and it's not thinking, it's not activated, guess what happens when you get into doing chi sao and you're doing uh, sparring and you're doing free fighting, this arm goes to sleep when you do this hand. We looked at that bit of that when we did chi sao. When you do something, this hand just goes to sleep. Because you're doing something here, your mind says, oh, it's all here, but this hand doesn't stay awake. So that's why it's so important to have that, uh, in, that um, activation through the arm that's not ac actually applying the movement. So even though we start the, the punch, it drives forward, your elbow, your fist comes onto the center, and then your elbow follows into the center, deep onto your center line. Now, come over for a second. 
Just stand next to me. Look how, look how much broader Lee is to me than... So our physiology is saying something. Now, Lee may not be able to get his elbow as close to the center line as me. He may be able to. Don't get me wrong. But pe people's physiology has a lot to play in how you apply your Wing Chun. So even though he might not be, get, might not be able to get his elbow as deep into the center as me without twisting, it doesn't have to be all the way in. It has to be inside the box of operation, inside the frame of his hip and his shoulder. He doesn't want his elbow out when he punches. Because when the elbow is out, it's not supported by the body. Now, you all heard this before, but it's important. When the elbow is out, all the power comes from the shoulder and the hip. And I've done it with you before. Just put your elbow out and face it here. When I push against that, you see it go down and you feel it through your body. So as soon as it comes, now turn, as soon as it comes inside the frame, now it should go down into the leg. Now this is, a, this is an important concept. You can come back over now. Thanks. This is an important concept because not only do we need to understand that for how we deliver a punch, which is really the first thing we're showing here, offense. Offense. That's the first real movement you're learning from the center. Not defense, to attack. That's, that's a big statement. Because you cannot win by defending. When you're about to be attacked or something's about to go, you know, bad, no, no good waiting. Your instincts tell you when something's not right and something's about bad's about to happen. You shouldn't always wait. When you are purely defensive, your, your ability to win a situation decreases very rapidly. So you must attack. That's what this is, what this is saying. Attack. Circle, seize, reverse elbow. Attack. Circle, seize, reverse elbow is the chanchuni, yun sao, lap sao, to seize, and jan, the reverse elbow. Jan is just elbow. Okay. Now, this movement with the elbow coming inside the frame is repeated over and over again within this form. So it, it's saying that this is important. This is important to bring your elbow in. Because one, I, as I said earlier, I want to deliver a punch that's supported not only through my footwork and my structure, my balance and my stance, so I can produce this power, the power um, equal to what I physically weigh, or what I'm transferring. But then the next movement that we do after that is the Wu Sao to Tan Sao. Elbow again comes into the center. Second movement. Two defensive movements. Very defensive movements. Wu Sao which basically means protecting hand, and then Tan Sao, which means dispersing hand with the thumb tucked in. Dispersing hand is crucial for dealing with a great deal of force because this is my Wu Sao. If we're parallel leg, which means we have the same leg forward, and I lead, my guard lead up with the... So this is my Wu Sao hand sits in my center. Now, when he throws that heavy uh, rear hand punch, it's, you know, the wild haymaker that people that, you know, start throwing on the street, most probably the most common front is the right hand coming like a, he's throwing a barrel of hay. Your Wu Sao is Tan Sao. Now, this is important because that for, I've just moved, because his eye sends a message to his arm that he wants the greatest amount of force with that rear hand to make contact with this point right here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move off that point. So from here to here, it's building momentum to that point. Now, the maximum power is going to be probably where I was. Yeah? So I definitely don't want to be there. So I drive, I drive this forward. So this is really where I was. Now what's going to be happening now is as it hits this point, it will drive and disperse down. 
Now, what this block basically does is I face it in a front stance. The force is traveled down, my elbow's in, so it's supported from here rather than having my elbow out. And if I try, if he's a lot, you know, 20, 30 kilos heavier than me, and he's got arms like tree trunks, if I tried to meet his punch with a clashing block or a, a force meeting force block, it's going to uproot my whole structure, which means I'll probably take my balance, move me around a lot, and make it harder for me to counter immediately. So again, it's coming to the center, so it's supported by my space. And secondly, then we do what we did first of all, the punch coming, coming from the hip inside the frame. So not only is the block supporting, be supported from your structure, but you're delivering power from your structure, your base. Not only are you getting, generating power from this structure, but you also generate power from this turn, this turning action. Now, to pivot or not to pivot? Pivot or step? Pivot or to step, 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 step. Positives and negatives. I might not have time to step. I might be standing here and he, come, he comes over and just throws a punch out of nowhere. Well, I, I instinctively want to step because I've been taught to do that. But sometimes being grounded is, is an advantage. Being grounded is an advantage because you, might, you, you have good balance when you're attached to the ground. The disadvantage with pivoting is I haven't moved my center of gravity or some people they, they lean but that means you lean onto one leg which means it take, even takes away further from your mobility. To stay in the center means I can step either leg at any moment. Yes, it would be main 50-50. If I pivot, I maintain good balance. I can transfer force by pivoting, but by staying right here means I still have to deal with a lot of force. So it has a positive and negative. If he throws that punch and I just pivot, I really haven't moved off the line. If I step, okay, the positive is I'm not, my, my center of gravity isn't where the most, the most amount of power is. But the disadvantage can be that I have to step. And when I step, what happens? Change your well, you have to. Now, even though I'm stepping, my weight can stay in the center. You understand? I can step and have my weight in the center still. But it still means you have to step, even if it's only a moment, which means it can disrupt your balance. So there's always going to be positive and negative arguments to step or not to step. For me, it's easy. The two most important things in self-defense and combat are balance and mobility. Mobility. Because you're dealing with a big guy who's much stronger than you. You want to be mobile. I don't know about you. I don't want to stand there and wait for him to jump on me. If you're dealing with more than one attacker, you have to be mobile. You have to be able to run, you have to be able to move and have mobility, but also have to have balance if you have to deal with something at that moment of, in, of interaction with your opponents. There has to be that, that balance between mobility and stability. Okay, so maybe sometimes you, you do just pivot and turn, but sometimes you may have to step. Stepping is more important. All right, it it's, it's just really comes down to the moment that you're in combat, the situation you're dealing with things, it's never cut and dry. It's never as easy as that. There are always going to be positives. There are going to be negatives to everything you do. All right. So here, you do your offensive movement. You do your defensive movement, which is the Wu Sao Tu Tan Sao. Wu Sao Tu Tan Sao. All right, if we just go back to here a little bit again. Again, center line, central line. Center line, Wu Sao. 
The people often, when you do the form, the Wu Xiao comes directly back in the center and drops into Fu Xiao. Okay. Um, so you have your center line, but then you have these lines over here, which are the central lines. So when we do our guard in Wing Chun, we don't put the guard right in the middle like this. You'll see a lot of Wing Chun systems. When the person puts their guard up, they go here, right in the middle. We don't do this, both hands right in the center of our own body. You can't, you should never fight front on like this. You expose too many targets to your opponent. It, it's much more like fencing. You have your center line, you have central lines. Your center line is the vulnerability. Again, there's vulnerability all over your body. There's pressure points all over your body. But the bridge of your nose, your throat, your solar plexus or sternum and your groin, pelvis can be bad as well, right in the middle of the pelvis. Okay, very vulnerable. You get hit in some of these areas, especially your throat, it can be the end of you. So just like sword fighting and fencing, they turn themselves side on, they put the weapon on the central line, they turn themselves directly side on. Now we don't have to be as dramatic as that, but they, it's the same sort of theory. If I want to have minimal targets, again, when I'm in a front stance, I can still use two arms at the same time. But I guard my leading hand, the lance or barring arm, sits directly on my central line. My Wu Sao sits on my center line. So this is my Wu Sao, this is my Lan Sao. Now a lot of Wing Chun systems say, okay, place the guard directly between the quickest line between yourself and your opponent. You can come back. The quickest line between yourself and your opponent. The center path. Now, if Daryl, just go on a slight angle, Daryl, on this angle, yeah, and put one side forward. Okay. I do not want to put my hand right here. And this comes back to our theory, our, our strategy. If Daryl now faced the camera in that front stance, if Daryl is in a front stance, this is his closest elbow, his leading elbow, that's the, the rear side. This is what we refer to the open side. This is the blind side, outside the leading elbow. Now, a lot of you have heard this theory before. When you're on the blind side, your center line should line up parallel to the shoulders, which means this shoulder should be 180 degrees away from you. Yeah. Now, you can face that point either in cross stance, which means I'm toe-to-toe, -to -toe, or parallel stance, which means I'm, I'm on the outside of his front foot with my leading foot, a parallel side. So, again, if I'm just turning the angle a bit, mirror image, it's parallel, which means we have the same side forward, or it's actually the opposite side, but it looked like a mirror image. Cross leg. The basic footwork rule is you land toe to toe, parallel, or outside the front foot. If I'm right over on the blind side, I can even be right behind the heel parallel. My center line line up to the shoulders, and I can use two arms at the same time from here. If I'm cross stance, I'm toe to toe, if I'm right in front, inside the front foot, because from when I move inside, I can turn his structure, now I'm on the blind side, because these two points line up to my center. When I move to the blind side in a defensive manner, I can still be toe to toe, but I'm now on the outside cross leg, okay? All right, so this elbow is really significant because if I put my hands right in the middle, if he puts it, come over here, now you do a Wing Chun guard and put your hands right in the middle. What he's actually doing is exposing, first of all, the first bridge. The first bridge is the wrist. Okay, which is the, really the first point of contact. Non-contact, contact. Now we can't hit each other from here, but if our guards are up, we can start grabbing at each other here and we can kick directly from the rear leg. If he has his hand right in the center, so just turn and face the, the camera again so the guys can see in the camera. If I'm in front of him in a, in a stance, I can expose this point in his leading hand. Now, if he extends his arm straight out, very interesting. 
and he resists. I have leverage over this point. Now, the problem for this is, look, a person might not slap it, but they may, they may jab and exploit this side now to get to this side. So what you're doing is you're actually giving a person an opportunity to attack your blind side by leaving your hand right in the middle. So if he makes a fighting stance and an open stance, I won't put my guard like this because now if he wants to jab with his hand, he feels compelled to come to the outside of this arm. Now a Wing Chun guy will say, oh great, because I'm going to cut that off. It's true, like some of them can get away with that. But if he got a longer limb and he's, being, he's on the offense, he's attacking, you often see these Wing Chun guys, like the punch will come and they get jammed up here, they get jammed up and off balanced here and then this goes whack and then they get caught right in the middle, right in the middle of everything. You don't want to get caught in the middle because when you're inside someone's arm, when you're inside someone, even though you can do this, he can use both his hands. You're right in the middle of these two points. He can grab, he can, he can do all this stuff to you. So, instead of putting my hand right in the middle and thinking, letting him think, ah, he can go to here. I say, no, I'm not letting you get on my blind side at all. I line up my leading arm with the outside of his elbow, that leading elbow. I'm not fighting this point. I'm fighting this side. I want this, this point, the elbow. You attack the elbow, you fight the elbow, you control the elbow, it all starts here. So, rather than putting my hands directly in the middle between him and me, I will line it on the outside of these two points, these two points here. Because now I'm forcing him to want to come inside, which means I can redirect with a basic park style. I can come underneath here and get to this side. I'm, only, I'm really taking away his option to get to my blind side. If he wants to come around that point now, he has to travel so much further because I'm already... Look, I don't even have to move my arm. If he does a straight jab, I'm not moving my arm at all. But that arm is covered now. You understand? I'm covering this lead. There's only two things he can really do with it now. He can try to come through the inside, or he can take the really long path and come around, or he can try to shovel it down, try to move it. All right, so this is just important for center and central line. We don't put it directly between ourselves and our opponent. We line it up with the outside of your opponent's lead to force them into our open side. Because when he comes into my open side, I have all my weapons to use. I can use all my things. He has to fight me one movement at a time from here. He has to. He has to fight me one movement at a time. However, if I let him get on that outside of that arm, and you're, you're here or here, now I have to deal with everything. I still have to deal with everything. So just the way you line yourself up, that psychological position, that structural point of fighting that elbow rather than trying to control your center, your center in his center, give you a big, a big advantage already. Because you're taking away his, his options just by covering that side. Now another prime example of this is what we do with, in seal and tower. We bring it to Wu Sao, we go to Tan Sao, you hewn your circle, which we do in the, the punch section as well, which is a redirection, a redirectioning movement or a releasing of energy movement. Let's talk about Hyun Sao a little bit first. Hyun Sao can be, if he press on me or push on me, I can come around. So I, if he pushes across, I can release force. If he pushes across and he throws that punch, I can redirect with a, a Hyun Sao. So if I catch something on the inside of the arm, I can redirect. If I'm on the outside of the arm, I can redirect to get into the inside. If I'm cross, it will take me to the outside. If I'm parallel and I'm on, parallel on top with the Fuxal, I can 
redirect with the Hyun Sao or release with the Hyun Sao and go forward. But the Fuk Sao, see if you do a Hyun Sao, the Fuk Sao is in there. It's like a, just a broken moment, a, a frozen moment of a Hyun Sao. If you do a Hyun Sao, that moment there is your Fuk Sao. Now some people just, some people are systems of Wing Chun, Fuk Sao is very loose and just sits sits on top or sits in like this. We do it so it doesn't sit horizontally. It sits down so my elbow comes in and it curls over. My thumb is tucked in behind my fingers. My fingers point down to my opposite toe on a 45 degree angle which creates a little, a little half box in there. Yeah? A little box. Now that box, when I get on top of an arm, the little finger will sit across the forearm, which means I feel his intention if he tries to go for, oh, in, in any direction. Because if I just sit like this and leave an opening here, I don't have that control of the limb. Fuxiao basically translates to subdue, to capture. Mm -hmm. To capture, to su subdue. The actual character comes from uh, a, uh, the dog. It's like the dog paw. When you see dogs playing, they put the paw over the top of the other do dog's head. Okay? So you see it in the Muay Thai guys. They do it as well. <laughs> we do it as You see a lot of these Wing Chun guys, they hook the back of their head like this. It's like, like, like the dogs do when they're playing with each other, jumping up on the back of their necks. All right, but we do it here. This position subdues here as well. Doesn't just let him hit release. So the little finger hooks just slightly. The intention again is always forward. The intent when you're doing this form, not on, even though you're, you're, you're structurally, you're stuck in the positions of the form, the intention should always be directly forward. Like drawing back a bow, holding the tension and wanting to release that bow. Okay, at any moment you should be able to release and strike in some capacity. Maybe how do you strike from a fuxa? You have to straighten your arm out and punch? Well, not necessarily, because from this position, if I hear, you just whip, whip with the finger, self-defense movement. All right, okay, so fuk sao, all right. Now the fuk sao subdues. And generally we'll do it from the blind side. So if I'm here, I probably wouldn't do a fuk sao right in front here, I cut the angle slightly. Now, Daryl will tell you, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on his arm. But if, if he wants to use this arm against me now, what does he need to do? Try to come around with a hook, push it into me, which means I can redirect with a garn or a jut. If he does the hook, I can use two arms, or if I'm quick enough, I can go forward. If he tries to punch with that rear hand, I can cross immediately, or I can trap immediately, if he tries to grab me, same thing applies. I'm just going to cross him up. So, you understand, when I did that fuk sao, I did it from the blind side. And I subdued his limb by controlling that limb. Because my forearm's in, you understand. My forearm is in, which limits his ability. Now, if he wants to roll that elbow over, he gives me the elbow immediately. A lot of guys think they can get over with the elbow. No. So, Understand, re relate that, that, that position, the fuxa position. So if I go like this to here, but now we go back and put your gut up, and I go here. What am I doing, really? It's like a non-contact position, but you're in a way of controlling the same point. You understand? Even though I don't have physical control over that limb, I'm compelling him to take, uh, take, take the opportunity. And what is the famous Wing Chun maxim? Welcome, welcome what comes, and help them leave or repel what goes, or chase what goes. All right, so I'm welcoming, I'm saying, hey, there's a big opening here. Then you can go after them. All right, okay, so, Look, we've got up to Fuk Sao section, Hyun Sao section, and we've talked about a lot of theory, and we've already got through quite a bit of the, 
you know, 40, 40 minutes, okay? But now we're gonna look at just that, that, that starting moment we talked about, and we're gonna look at some of the, how ways we can start applying this, the way I just showed you, but a, a few drills we can do.